Come join me on my second channel, Jaguar Gator 8, where we'll talk all things college football. New video drops every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch the latest video. And now, on with our feature presentation. Remember the absolutely ridiculous rumor that was floating around last offseason, where the Buffalo Bills were rumored to be considering a move to Austin, Texas? It seems like those reports died pretty quickly, and for good reason. Aside from the fact that the Bills should not leave Buffalo, it's very obvious that Austin is Cowboys territory, and there's no way that Jerry Jones would allow a team to come into Austin and take a sizable chunk of his territory. The Cowboys are easily the most popular team in the city, and there's no close second. Austin might be the most powerful secondary market in the country because of how big they are from a population and a TV market standpoint, and because of just how many people there love the Cowboys. It's hard to imagine Cowboys fans in Austin being unable to watch their team play, with the Cowboys being preempted for something else. Yet in 1981, that's exactly what happened. And man, did it cause a giant uproar. During week two of the 1981 season, the NFL and CBS made the bizarre decision, which it seems like it easily could have been avoided, to not televise the Cowboys' home opener against the St. Louis Cardinals. Call it poor planning, call it poor market research, call it just sheer incompetence and stupidity, or call it whatever you want. Either way, you had a major conflict on your hands with just how badly this was butchered. And this is the story behind the bizarre broadcasting controversy involving the NFL, CBS, and the city of Austin, Texas. Before I talk about the controversy in question, we need some context to understand the game in question, as well as what CBS originally had planned for that day that led to this entire fiasco in the first place. Entering Week 2 of the 1981 season, you had an NFC East rivalry between the Dallas Cowboys and St. Louis Cardinals down at Texas Stadium for the very first home game that the Cowboys would be playing. And aside from the fact that this was the home opener, there were many Cowboys fans that were pumped for this game, and understandably so. The expectations for the Cowboys were super high, as they made it to the NFC Championship the year before, and show that even though Roger Staubach was no longer there, that they could still win with Danny White under center. If you want to learn more about the career of Danny White, click the card in the upper right corner. And when you combine that with the fact that Dallas won their opening game of the season fairly convincingly, taking a 26-10 over Washington, while never trailing at any point during the contest, it's no surprise why Cowboys fans were excited to watch their team play as they tried to go to 2-0 and beat a Cardinals team that entered this game as a sizable 10-point underdog. To the surprise of no one, Texas Stadium was sold out, with over 63,000 spectators in attendance to watch this one, so the blackout rule was not an issue here. If you were in Dallas and couldn't get a ticket to the game, don't worry, because you were able to watch this one at home. And if you were able to watch it at home, you got to see a fairly dominant performance by the hometown team as the Cowboys won this one fairly convincingly, winning a 30-17 after leading by three possessions at the end of three quarters. Running back Tony Dorsett had a fantastic game, averaging over eight yards per carry while picking up 174 yards from scrimmage. The Cowboys scored an incredible 27 points in the first half, scoring on five separate possessions. In other words, every time the Cowboys touched the ball in the first 30 minutes of the contest, it seemed as though the Cardinals had no answers. And while the pass defense allowed some big plays, including multiple completions of over 60-plus yards, for the most part, they played really well. Cardinals starting quarterback Neil Lomax threw two interceptions and went just 14 for 41, completing a mere 34.1% of his passes. Keep in mind that another reason that this game was big and was drawing attention was because this was the first ever start that Lomax was going to be making in his NFL career. He was drafted by the Cardinals in the second round of the 1981 NFL Draft, and after Jim Hart got the start in Week 1, Lomax was going to be under center to start the game for the first time ever in Week 2. Obviously, there was nothing to compare it to at the time, since it was his first start, but to give you some perspective on how well the Cowboys' defense played and how inefficient Lomax was, in his great career where he made it to two Pro Bowls, Lomax had 88 games where he threw at least 20 passes. This game was quite easily his worst completion percentage ever, and only two other times in his career did he complete less than 40% of his passes under those circumstances. So from an on-the-field perspective, this was a pretty good day for Cowboys fans, especially if you were at the game or you were in the Dallas area. But if you were in Austin or any of the other secondary markets, good luck watching the game. Because let's just say that CBS and the NFL dropped the ball big time. The U.S. Open is the biggest tennis tournament in the United States, and it's the last of the four majors comprising the Grand Slam, along with the Australian Open, the French Open, and Wimbledon. Nowadays, the U.S. Open is exclusively televised on ESPN, so even though the final for the men's singles tournament takes place on the first Sunday after Labor Day at 4 o'clock Eastern, which is the same time that football is taking place, this is a complete non-issue, since ESPN does not televise NFL games on Sundays. 
But from 1968 until 2014, CBS held the TV rights. You might be able to see where a problem can arise, since CBS cannot show both the US Open final and NFL football at the same time. Still, for the final few years, this was also a complete non-issue for the NFL and for everyone involved, because people develop brains. If you ever wondered why during the 2000s and the first half of the 2010s, it always seemed like Fox had a doubleheader to start the season off, well, that was why. CBS would show a 1 o'clock game and would show no games in the 4 o'clock window, as the league and its schedule makers would design the schedule in a way where only games where an NFC team was on the road would be shown at 4 o'clock. Just to showcase this example in action, here's the schedule from week 1 of the 2014 season. We're assuming that cross-flexing between the networks does not exist, as this practice did not become commonplace until a few years ago. Notice how there's only two games zone in the 4 o'clock window. However, both of them are games that would traditionally be televised by Fox. CBS would get to air the US Open, and your local Fox affiliate would air either the Panthers-Buccaneers game or the 49ers-Cowboys game, which, let's be honest, judging by the TV map and judging by what you know about those markets, you were getting the 49ers-Cowboys game. No, I have no clue why there's a random blob in West Virginia that somehow got Panthers-Buccaneers that week, but that's beside the point. The point is that this seemed like a very easy problem to plan around. Heck, if NFL schedule makers, without advanced computers and algorithms, could plan around the 10,000 stadium conflicts that existed back in the 1970s and 1980s with teams that shared a stadium with a Major League Baseball team, surely they could plan it so that on the Sunday after Labor Day, NBC would have the doubleheader, CBS would have the singleheader, and you wouldn't have a single NFC team playing on the road in the late time slot. Oh my sweet summer child, how wrong you would be. Is it even surprising at this point considering all the videos I've done about the NFL and the TV networks not using their brains with regards to television rights? that they would find a way to screw this very easy problem up. Because in 1981, CBS had not one, not two, but three games that were going to be airing at the 4 o'clock window directly against the US Open. You have the San Francisco 49ers taking on the Chicago Bears, which is irrelevant for the purposes of our story. You have the Detroit Lions taking on the San Diego Chargers, which is also irrelevant for the purposes of our story. And you have the aforementioned game between the Dallas Cowboys and the St. Louis Cardinals. Now, to be fair, conflicts like this have been going on for years. So it wasn't like this just happened in 1981. For example, remember in 1980 when Detroit Lions running back Billy Sims had arguably the greatest debut by any running back in NFL history, running for 153 yards and 3 touchdowns in a shocking win over the defending NFC champion Los Angeles Rams? That took place at 4 o'clock Eastern opposite the US Open on CBS. Or remember in 1978 when the Chicago Bears drove down the field and scored the game-winning touchdown on the San Francisco 49ers with 3 minutes left to take it 16-13? That took place at 4 o'clock Eastern opposite the US Open on CBS. However, CBS had a solution for this problem that, while not perfect, seemed like the best thing to do. While every other market in the country would get the final of the US Open, in markets where the hometown NFL team was playing, you would get the game. In other words, let's say that the Eagles are playing on CBS at 4 o'clock Eastern on that first Sunday after Labor Day. If you were in Philadelphia, you would get the Eagles game instead of the Open. If you were in Montana, however, you would get the Open. If the Open was still going on when the NFL game ended, you get to go down to Armstrong Stadium, since that was still where the final was held before Arthur Ashe was constructed, for the rest of the Open joined in progress. If the Open was not going on, since it ended in three sets or a quick four sets, you would get an hour-long highlight show after the fact of what transpired. Again, why the league couldn't just design the schedule so that no NFC team played on the road at 4 o'clock, I have no clue. But that was just the way the cookie crumbled back in 1981. And to be fair to CBS, they tried to get the NFL and the Cowboys to move their game up to 1 o'clock Eastern instead of 4 o'clock. However, the Cowboys did not want to do that, and they refused to make the switch. There were two reasons for that. Number one, it was going to be too hot. Playing at 3 o'clock in the summer in Texas when it's starting to cool down during the second half is way better than playing at 12 o'clock, when the sun will be at its peak position during the game. And number two, the game was going to be hard to play at 12 o'clock Central Time, because of how the positioning of the sun created a glare thanks to the whole of the top of Texas Stadium. Now, if you're baffled as to how these explanations worked, seeing as teams like the Jaguars play in early September at 1 o'clock in an open-aired stadium in Swampland, Florida, back in 1977, the Cowboys played a Week 2 game against the New York Giants. But even though the Cowboys won rather convincingly, taking it 41-21, the game was particularly notable for the heat, where it was 88 degrees with 58% humidity. This posed a major problem as the Cowboys did not want a repeat of that. As team president Tex Schramm said on that game, half the field was in sun. As a result of the combination of heat and humidity, several Giants players got in very serious trouble because of the heat. Emergency action was required in the New York dressing room. 
And we also had problems. Because of this episode and the obvious potential danger, the League makes every effort to schedule the Dallas Cowboys away on the first two weekends, and if this is not possible, schedule a late game so that the Sun problem would be eliminated or greatly lessened. As a side note, if you want to learn more about that 1977 game between the Cowboys and Giants that posed these major health problems, click the card in the upper right corner. In short, the Cowboys were going to still play the Cardinals at 4 o'clock Eastern, directly against the US Open. Again, this changed absolutely nothing if you were in Dallas. If you turned on CBS during the late window on September 13th, 1981, you were going to get that matchup between the Cowboys and the Cardinals, and we're going to see that Cowboys game in its entirety as they dominated and defeated their division rivals. But what about secondary markets like Austin? CBS had a message for the 400,000 people living down there, and for all the Cowboys fans living in that city. You're a Cowboys fan? Too bad. Screw you guys, you're not getting the game. You're going to get tennis, and you're going to like it. And let's just say that the uproar from this decision was not pleasant. Before I go any further, to further emphasize just how ridiculous and asinine this decision was, I have to note that this was not the first time that the Cowboys had that late game during this Sunday running up against the US Open. On September 9, 1979, during Week 2 of the NFL season, the Cowboys played the 49ers at 4 o'clock Eastern, and CBS's rules regarding where the Open could be televised were in place. Austin aired the Cowboys game, which makes sense, because again, this is a secondary market of the Cowboys that we're talking about. Yet for some inexplicable reason, CBS decided that Austin would have rather watched tennis over the Cowboys. As CBS spokesman Jay Rosenstein said, the decision was made simply because we had a conflict. The US Open Championship is the most important event in tennis in the country, and the men's final is the culmination of the 31 hours of our coverage. The way we tried to reconcile the conflict was by giving football to the home cities and tennis to everyone else, which led to understandable and predictable outrage across the entire region, not just from frustrated fans, but from Cowboys personnel and higher-ups within the organization. Tech Schramm said that this decision by CBS was one of the worst examples of ignoring the desires and affiliates and their viewers that I've seen in quite some time. Schramm even encouraged fans to call CBS and voice their complaints. One Texas affiliate station, which was powerless, as this was a decision made by the executives in New York, received 300 calls per day about this, with all of them protesting the decision to show tennis over the Cowboys. Down in Lubbock, where they were in the same boat with being screwed over by CBS, local station KLBK-TV ran an ad in the paper, the Lubbock Avalanche Journal, asking people whether they'd rather watch the Cowboys-Cardinals game or the final of the US Open. No surprises, but in an absolute landslide of a vote, the Cowboys game won. Who would have thought that football would win over tennis, in Texas? And to show just how bad CBS messed up, one CBS spokesman not only said that individuals were furious about this and were complaining by the numbers, but also said, affiliates are throwing up their hands and telling everyone to call here. It seemed like the vast majority of people were not exactly happy with this decision. You would have thought that after the whole incident involving Wichita Falls a few years before, that CBS would have learned their lesson about not messing with Texas, especially when the Cowboys were involved. But I guess not. You can learn more about that controversy from the 1979 season, which was less than two years prior, by clicking the card in the upper right corner. The good news for Cowboys fans was that CBS did not stick to their guns, and decided after hearing these complaints that they messed up. The bad news was that they tried to fix this in literally the worst way possible, because a few days before the game, citing a passion for Cowboys football, CBS announced the new plan for the affiliates in areas like Austin was as follows. They were still stuck with the US Open in the late window, no matter what. However, with regards to what NFL game they could televise, they now had two options. They could show a game at 1 o'clock, as they were originally going to, or they could show the Cowboys-Cardinals game at 10.30 or 11.30 at night on tape delay. You had two options. You either had no Cowboys or really delayed Cowboys, but live Cowboys was not an option. Amazingly enough, CBS made a decision that was infinitely worse than the last one, and here's why. NFL rules prohibited a network that was not assigned a doubleheader designation from being able to show two games on the same day. In other words, Barring the rare weeks when you had Sunday Night Football, you would never get more than three games on in one Sunday. You would get two NBC games and one CBS game, or vice versa. This meant that if you chose the Cowboys tape delay option, you were not getting an early game on CBS, because the one game you get would be with the second half taking place past midnight. Now you might be asking yourself how that's a worse option than the original one. Well, let's say you're a football fan, and more importantly, a Cowboys fan upset by all of this. Under the original plan, you would be furious, and rightfully so, but assuming you were going to stay in your home and not travel up to Dallas to go to a bar where the game would be showing, or rent out a motel room, 
you'd accept that awful decision and would watch whatever game NBC had on in the later window. But under this plan, you're not gonna do that. Because what do other networks do when they're airing games? They show the scores from other games. So if you want to watch the Cowboys on tape delay during the wee hours of the morning when you have to work the next day and have to get up early, you have to avoid conflict with anything that could be a spoiler, including the NBC game taking place at the same time. Instead of getting six hours of continuous football, if you chose this option, you were only getting three. Because I don't know about you, but I'm not watching a tape delayed game where I know the outcome and know exactly what happens and how it ends. Even back in 1981, there was not a huge market for tape delay when you know the outcome. Plus, I'm sure all the advertisers that pay top dollar to show their ads on CBS during the NFL game were absolutely thrilled at the fact that these ads were now going to be seen at midnight and 1 a.m. It's amazing at the ability of everyone involved in this situation to make a poisonous drink out of lemons. But that's exactly what happened here. As any Cowboys fan who was watching John McEnroe defeat Bjorn Borg in four sets to win his third US Open title was furious at just how poorly the situation was handled. I think the crazy part about all this might be just how easy and simple it was to avoid this conflict and to not have this problem arise in the first place. And fortunately, in 1982, the NFL and CBS came to their senses and decided to not have any NFC teams on the road during that first Sunday after Labor Day, with all four late games being NBC games, allowing the whole country to have the option of watching their team or the US Open at 4 o'clock Eastern, and to not be at the mercy of some higher-ups. But there are so many valuable lessons from this blunder that CBS and the NFL failed to understand. Know the market and the people in it and their interests and what they want to watch. Know any possible scheduling conflicts and do everything in your power to avoid them before they even become an issue. And if your crisis management solution is to create a plan that might somehow be even worse than the original plan for the average football fan, you need to seriously reevaluate things. Because in 1981, Cowboys fans all across Texas were saying that CBS committed a double fall. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.